Events happen that change our lives. Dealing with change is what we do. We discuss with industry professionals objective solutions to work through cherished items and family memories. When we go beyond the gavel, we provide tools and information to deal with these crisis times. Hello, I'm Shane Feely. Welcome back to Beyond the Gavel. Many times in the auction industry, we run into a case where a family is having some difficult times because they've had something happen to the loved one in their family. Today, we are here to see Don Hansen from the ARC Group. He's in insurance and consulting. And Don has some helpful ideas for us and some great information on long-term health insurance and kind of how to prepare for those times so that you're not doing it in a panic situation. Hi, Don. Thanks for coming. Hi, Shane. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You bet. So when we're talking about long-term care and health care in general for someone who's been hurt, what can you kind of add to that? Um, and, and, and I think it's important that we start with some definitions. Right, and, and really taking a couple steps back because it really never starts or shouldn't ever start with insurance. It really needs to start with a definition, right? So what is long-term care to begin with? And it's really a continuum of care, the, the types of care being provided both short and long-term for people who have had an illness or injury. Sure. What sure. types of care are being provided? So we'll talk about long-term care. Is it skilled? Is it nursing home? Does it depend on the needs of the loved one? Sure, and it's amazing how many people, this is a really kind of a confusing thing for people, right? Um, there are different types of care, and really the care boils down to one of three different types. It's skilled care, intermediate care, custodial care. Skilled care is very expensive care. It's administered by professionals. It's, it's not really long-term in nature. It's usually somewhat short-term in nature. Sure. Intermediate care tends to be a little bit more, uh, it could be a little bit more longer term, but it's the custodial care, the help with regular traditional activities of daily living. That's the long-term care side yes. of long-term okay, care. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, tell us about uh, the custodial care. Sure, well, in, in custodial care, intermediate care, or skilled care, all three types of care provided in nursing homes, assisted livings, or even at home. It's the activities of daily living, the bathing, eating, dressing, sure. the, the hygiene. That is what is defined as an activity of daily living. It's the basic activities in life that we learn from a very young age. So those, that would that be the care level that you would go to from your home if you had not had something catastrophic happen? Sure. Well, most people would prefer to stay at home if they possibly Absolutely. can, right? So I know I would for sure. So it really depends on the plan of care that's in place as to whether we can keep somebody in the home as long as possible because okay. really ultimately most people would rather stay there again than go to a facility. Oh, absolutely. So let's talk about skilled care. Is this what happen after a critical incident or an event that is life-changing for your family member? Absolutely, and it's, it's a really tough time. If you think about a critical condition or illness, injury, whatever it is, when that, in, when that happens, family members aren't necessarily thinking straight. It's a very, very tough time, a lot of stress, and the worst time a worst time possible for somebody to actually start planning care. Oh, absolutely. So we're you're, generally we're hoping that they're planning ahead, talk with their attorney, have a will, have their plan laid out so that it, it's not as traumatic as it can be for even the whole family. Exactly, exactly. And you brought up a really good point in that any kind of plan, really the foundation of that plan is legal documents. That's the first place for somebody to go, is actually starting to talk with their attorney about setting up the right kind of legal documents. Okay. So when we talk about um, the long-term care services and we talk custodial and uh, the skilled care, then what would be a an, an, uh, last place? Would that be then the move to hospice? Sometimes, and or in, in some cases, it's, you know, somebody started off in a nursing home, but they've now actually progressed and they're getting better. Sure. So they do end up, you know, being able to go back home, which is really the ultimate goal. Uh, you know, of course, and in certain circumstances where we have a terminal, you know, it's, it's uh, not looking good. There's not too much time in which case, like you said, it's hospice, hospice might be, is might going be the, to be the place. And sometimes people do go home and then have hospice in their home as well. That's right. Okay. So that's, that's, right. that's kind of a nice way to talk about that because I don't always understand when someone says we're at hospice and are at a hospital, what that exactly means, or their hospice at home. So thank you very much for that. Right, right. 
Um, what is, what, what plan of care would, would be the easiest for someone to do and when should you start your plans? Right, well in any kind of a plan, people don't plan to fail, they fail the plan, right? Correct. So right Correct. now, right now is the time to begin planning. Right now, there isn't the stress, there isn't the circumstances, hopefully. You know, right now is the time to start making a couple phone calls. What is the cost of nursing home or assisted living or even home care? Call one of the facilities and ask. Sure. If, they're, if you're fortunate to not have experiencing that right now with a loved one, you know what, there's, there's no pressure, there's no stress. It's getting a good idea of what the cost is now before it's sticker shock in addition to the stress that you're going through. You know, sometimes um, I feel that it's hard to talk to your parent about something like that because they feel pretty good. They don't feel like there's ever going to be a need for them to go somewhere like that. So is it kind of a difficult situation to talk about? I'd say this is a really, really difficult subject to talk about, and especially with a parent because they're still parent, right? In right. their mind, they're still parent, you're still kiddos. They, you know, saw you growing up and perhaps they, they trust you but may not necessarily respect all of your expertise. Sure. And so they still are independent and sometimes fiercely independent, right? And they have their own ideas of what they'd like to see. And I think some people assume that it's just gonna be, you know, my spouse or the children that's gonna ultimately end up taking care of me. Right. And you know, if in those circumstances, the spouse is of course gonna be there to take care of you know, their loved one. Sure. Same thing with the children. But what we run into dynamics are right now, the spouse might be taking care of them, doing a good job, but as we get older and we, beget, we get more frail, what is the likelihood of that care to be as good as it could have been or was in the past, right? right. You know, for children who may have a job, they've got their own children, they've got their own lives, they wanna take care of mom and dad, but sometimes they just don't have the ability to do that. Right. And like we were talking earlier, you know what, there's people that, you know, kiddos are living out of town now. Right. And so we have an issue here with long-term care is that it rarely brings families together, it more often tears families apart. So communication here is critical. And of course, if you do bring home the folder and you sit it down and you talk to your uh, older or aging parent or your loved one, um, you want to make sure that everybody in the family knows what's going on and that what their plans are so that you don't have someone who's left out feeling right. like we need to maybe, no, no, can we try something different? Because um, I think that that happens a lot. It sure does. It sure does. And I think, you know, with, with you know, Families who have more than one kiddo, everybody has their own opinion on what would be best. Sure. And now is the best time to start getting opinions and thought processes out there so that we can understand what a good plan of care can look like. And just as important as developing a degree of that plan of care is figuring out how are we going to pay for that plan of care. And that's always kind of scary because the cost of home, uh, nursing home care right now is expensive, but you have so many professional people providing services to your loved one that it, it is expensive and three meals a day. And just the regulations that go along with those facilities gives them a higher overhead than, of course, you would have at your house. Huh. You've got your typical taxes and things like that. So how do we, how do we look at that? It's a really good question, and, and really what, what we need to understand is there's five funding mechanisms to long-term care, five different options, and helping people understand what those five things are and how to utilize as many of those five funding mechanisms as, we, as they can is really important. So the five funding mechanisms are Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Administration, self-insuring, and long-term care insurance. And people need to understand what Medicare does and doesn't do. You know, there are certain circumstances where Medicaid just simply is not a viable option. Sure. And same thing with Veterans Administration. So in, in many cases, we find that instead of five, there's three options. And a lot of people do tend to go a self-insured route, which I encourage a degree of that. And then, of course, there's long-term care insurance, which is a part of funding properly. Okay. So eliminating from three to two and what Medicare and Medicaid doesn't do, that's always a big question because 
those terms are thrown ar around like, well, I've got Medicare, I'm Medicaid, and when you're looking at a transition like that, it can be a little confusing. It absolutely is confusing, and especially whether you're in a long-term care need or not, just the terms Medicare and Medicaid tend to be very confusing. Right. And so taking a step back and understanding what Medicare is, it's a federal program designed for somebody that's turning 65 on uh, renal, end-stage renal failure, or under age 65 due to a disability. I see. And it's, it's a healthcare program. So Medicare has two parts, part A and part B. Part A is for inpatient care in a, in a, in a hospital, and part B is more of the outpatient type of care. There are some provisions that will pay for shorter term care, but there isn't provisions in Medicare to pay for long term care. And when long term care does pay for any care, it's skilled in nature. So the intermediate and custodial care, Medicare doesn't touch it at all. Okay. And people, when, when they don't know what they don't know, they think, well, gee, Medicare is going to be there. And Medicare was never designed for that. So if I'm someone who has had Blue Cross and Blue Shield health care plan with mm -hmm. my company for years and I'm retired and I still have that coverage that I'm paying for, that's going to fill in some gaps wouldn't it, and as far as insurability. Mm -hmm. So I have my health insurance and I have Medicare right? and I may have a long-term plan for nursing for one of the skilled cares, but what about if you max out your benefits on the two then what do you do? That's a really good question. So this is where putting a plan of care in place is really, really important. And determining where your assets are and how much you want to protect. Because at some point in time, if you've maxed out your benefits in, say, a long-term care insurance policy, and you have maxed out Medicare benefits, and you are now at a place where you're having to self-fund your care, how much money do you have set aside to self-fund that care? and working with the right attorney, what did you do to plan for Medicaid? See, Medicaid is one of the five funding mechanisms, but in that mechanism, the, the point of Medicaid is spending down assets to pay for care. The point of long-term care planning is protecting assets, so you don't have to spend them down. Well, good trying point. Trying to protect them. Good point, that's a great point. So, if you're planning ahead, you're not, and you haven't set up a revocable trust or mm -hmm. anything like that, what, how do you approach to cover yourself so that you don't run out of money? It's a great question and that's where it goes back to making sure that we sit down with the attorney to begin with because it's those legal documents that really begin the, the, the plan. Sure. The plan for care starts with legal documents 100% of the time and insurance is just a, a component but it's a small, really ultimately a small component, but it is certainly a piece. Okay, so when Medicaid kicks in and then you are using other resources as well as your own, and that's why they would say we're moving from one place or one level of care to another, and people buy new furniture and new lamps and things for their loved one to spend down, well, in a spend down for Medicaid, it doesn't mean you're spending the money on yourself at that point. It means now the state's going to start recuperating money that it's going to have to start spending on your care. And that is where it really starts to get sad because people without a plan didn't anticipate the fact that they might have started to give money away and the state can go back after money that's given away within a certain time frame. It's a really tough scenario to be in without a plan. Right. Very important things to think about. Very important. and. You know, nobody ever expects to get long-term care, and you did mention that, but what if it, with this uh, life-changing event that someone falls, breaks a hip, as they say, what are their options when the kids are in the room? Or are, is, are, can they still get a long-term care insurance policy? Is it more expensive, or did it change the... Uh, acceptability by the insurance company for that plan? Sure, sure, and this is a really, it's a great question and it's a tough question at the same time because when somebody's looking to get insurance, I find sometimes it's when the barn is burning. Mm -hmm. 
And unfortunately, if the barn's burning at that <laughs> point, right. there's not anybody who's <laughs> going to insure the barn. So the reality of the circumstances, and this goes back to what we were saying before, is right now is the time to plan. The younger a person is, the less expensive a policy looks like. Um, you know, the more we look at how much can we self-insure and then take that into consideration, we can have a lesser expensive policy because we're utilizing more of those different funding mechanisms, right? I see. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And the longer that you're, that you're ill or not in home and it takes you to heal and do your physical therapy and those types of things, what are we looking at and what about living a long life? What do they mean by that? I know we're living longer now than we ever did before. Right, and think about the reasons why. Medical technology and advanced science, I mean, we're living longer than we ever have, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're living, we're living healthier. Sure. Right, so as we're living longer in our communities, we have more time to spend with our family and our friends and, and be a part of the community we've helped build. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna be healthy during that time frame. How do we put that plan of care in place so that we can still enjoy our family and our family can enjoy us, right. friends, community the same? Well, and we talked about it earlier, and, and males are living to be about 78 average, and women are living to be 81. I can remember when people were under five foot high, and, and due to nutritional things, you know, they weren't as tall, they weren't as big, and things like that. So we are living longer. Um, what are the odds of needing long-term care and, and some of these plans? You know, and here's the thing about insurance agents, not all of them, but certainly some of them. You know, they're going to use, and salespeople in general, going to use a lot of statistics to try and emotionally encourage somebody to buy a policy. And the way I look at statistics are kind of funny. 85% of all statistics are made up, right? Right. The odds are high that somebody's going to need to have some form of care. And the reason why is because we're living longer. So the longer somebody lives, the more likely they are at an injury or illness and needing some form of care. And because care tends to be the largest catastrophic risk to a retirement plan, insurance, in my opinion, needs to be used to protect against the catastrophic risk part of that. Well, the cost of long-term care can be expensive. Is it, is it, and of course it's rising like the, with inflation like everything else. What are your thoughts on, you know, how, how soon should I prepare at age 50, at age 55? For sure, for sure. Now, as soon as possible, because it ends up being, putting that plan of care in place, you have an idea of what that plan's gonna look like, and now you're putting the funding mechanisms in place. You know what Medicare is gonna contribute, you know what you need to do in, a, in a, an insurance policy, and what are we gonna do self-funded wise, and we can bring our own assets to the table. We start to put together an equation there, and really it can be a very effective way of pricing out what it can look like in the future. Sure. So go through the importance of having a plan of care and you mentioned that people don't don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Right. When you're when you're looking at that, where would you start first? There's two things that people really need to make sure that they pay attention to and number one is who is going to provide my care. We know that the spouse is going to help out because they love you. We know that the children are gonna help out because they love you, but neither one of them want to be primary caregivers. They're secondary caregivers. Primary caregivers are people who have been trained properly to provide certain kinds of care. So who is going to provide the care? Professionals, primary, secondary being family members, and then of course, where do we prefer care to be provided? Nursing home, assisted living, home care, Clearly, a lot of people, most people want to stay at home for as long as possible. And when they do end up making a transition, is the transition directly to a nursing home, which tends to concern a lot of people, of course, because it's had, nursing homes have had such bad publicity over the years. And I would say the overwhelming majority don't have that anymore. They, they're run really well. But assisted living, people still get to keep their independence to a degree. And right. I mean, I, I know for me, I, I'm pretty independent and so if I want to stay independent I know I'm gonna live longer if I feel I don't have to depend on everybody for oh, every small thing. <clears throat> well and I think that you need to give your loved one the opportunity to get right back to their life when they can and right. give them opportunity and I guess then if they try to put out the weeds in the front yard with gas can then then you'd try to do something. Yeah that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard of that happening twice. Right. Um, but let's say it's 
we have gone through, the, we're at the hospital and we're looking. Um, do you recommend trying to find a service to help you find a place for your loved one or use a social worker? How, what is your recommendation to help so find someone to take the best care of your loved one once this catastrophe's happened? How imperative are advisors in our lives? You know, having an advisor in life for nearly anything, getting wise counsel is critical. And especially during a time where if we're in the middle of experiencing the circumstance, how very, very important is the as much counsel as we can possibly get. Sure, absolutely. Right? So social workers can be very, very important in the process, right? Because not only are they going to help, you know, with determining where to go or what to do, they, they also have that side of them, these wonderful people have that side of them of being very empathetic, right? Right. And, and so having those type of professionals uh, available to you is huge. You know, your financial advisors, your attorney, People like that, these are people who have been through this time and time again, can make wonderful, excellent recommendations. Sure. And to be able to rely on them and to be teachable because you know what, at, at some point, we've all met people who may or may not necessarily listen to wise counsel. No. Yeah, can you believe that? <laughs> so to be able to be teachable and not only listen, but but go by wise counsel is really, really important. Right, right. And right now we're at a time where there are, they say there's two generations of people downsizing, but there's really three. You have your Korean War vets, mm. you have your Vietnam vets, and you have your baby boomers. And right now um, is a time of flux for our whole country. And as we mentioned, their children are out of town a lot. How would they, what's the best avenue for them to find someone like, like you to help consult them through this? Boy, that's a really good question. The last thing they want to do is necessarily just pick up the phone and just hope that they're talking to somebody that is, you know, professional or understands what they're doing. And, um, you know, first off, Omaha is a really great community. We're one degree, maybe two degrees separation from knowing anybody right. here, right? And so, number one, asking some of the people you know, do they know a good attorney? And usually a good attorney is going to know really good planning professionals, sure. financial advisors, insurance agents, etc. that, you know, to be able to utilize that professional's warm market is a really Almost excellent opportunity. Importance, Absolutely. Isn't it? Um, and then there's also professional caregivers. I know there are people who help you find the place where your loved one can afford to live for the longest with the kind of income that they have and things like that. Um, we talked about where will be care provided. Um, on the long-term care, would you recommend for them to really look at a facility that takes long-term care in, into skilled care and into hospice or something else? Well, it's a good question, and, and really, because nursing facilities tend to be more skilled care, but they provide skilled, intermediate, and custodial, um, it almost doesn't matter what nursing home you, you speak with. So what, what tends to be really the focus is how close is the nursing facility to where the kiddos that are going to be providing the secondary Absolutely. care are going to be, right? And so that's really important. Same thing with assisted living facilities. Where's the location? Of course, the location, location, right? right. Um, and then at home for as long as possible, but you know, sometimes that's just not an option. Right, well, they do have some great services to provide home health care here in our area, and, and I'm sure everywhere else too. Oh, yeah. There are some great, great uh, companies who've been out there for quite some time. If you had a choice between where you were gonna go, how would you help your loved one make that choice? Do you haul them to 10 nursing homes or? get them pictures or have the people come and visit them, go to lunch. Right, and it could be a combination of several things, really. You know, first off, it's a conversation with the medical f professionals, right? So who are the medical professionals taking care of my loved one? Or me, for that matter, you know? Who, wh what, what are their opinion? You know, they've probably been through this circumstance before. Who did they know? And have they had any recommendations as well? I mean, if, if you're stuck in a circumstance where you didn't plan for care and now you need to have the care, I would say the medical professionals that are providing the care are really going to do a good job of being able to give very good suggestions. Okay. How would we fund a plan of care? So really going back to those five funding mechanisms, right? Medicare is going to be a piece, but it certainly won't pay for long-term. It pays for short-term. Medicaid, 
the whole purpose of funding a funding long-term care or plan of care is to protect our retirement, to protect our assets. If there's really no assets to protect, well, perhaps Medicaid is a real option, sure. right? So if if our goal is to protect our retirement plan, then clearly Medicaid is not going to be a very good, you know, um, mechanism, option. right? Veterans Administration, you know, not everybody is a veteran. My dad is a Vietnam vet. Very grateful. Um, these are wonderful people that deserve more than what really they get, yes, right? Yeah. But with the Veterans Administration that's more skilled nursing home care, there's very limited home care as well, certainly no assisted living. And then you deal with self-insurance where you're going to go wherever you want to go, of course, as for as long as you can afford it. Okay. Long-term care insurance will help you be able to afford it longer. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're beyond the gavel. We've had a great talk here with Don Hansen from the ARC Group. He's insurance and consulting, and he's trying to share information with us so that we know what to do when our families have a catastrophic illness or something happens to our loved one. Thank you very much, Don, for coming in today. It has just been awesome. Thanks, Shane. Really appreciate it. You bet. So we'll see you next time.